Well, we welcome back Adam Crichton, the economics editor of The Australian, about to take up a major appointment in Washington, D.C. But while he's there, we'll be talking to him each week to gain some insight into the changing world of the economy. Adam, thank you for your time. You've written today, brilliantly, as you always do, that last month Goldman Sachs Global Chief Executive David Solomon said he wanted all his staff back in the office in New York by the end of the northern summer. Working from home, he said, is an aberration which we're, we are going to correct as quickly as possible. It is not a new normal. Adam, you've written mm. about this because the bulk of Australia's white-collar workforce is still working from home and occupancy of commercial office towers in Sydney and Melbourne is at half mm. and a third of the level, respectively, of a year ago. What does this mean mm. for commercial real estate and for jobs? Well, look, certainly for the owners of those offer towers, you know, which includes Australia's superannuation funds, I might add, it's a complete disaster. I mean, as you just said, the occupancy one year on from the start of the restrictions is, you know, is barely 50%. And you know, for me, it's such an odd situation because if it was so rational for so many of us to be working from home uh, because of the improved productivity, uh, then why weren't we doing it a couple of years ago? Were we too stupid to see these extraordinary productivity benefits of staying at home? Or are we just staying at home now because it's easier and it's more flexible and so forth? I mean, it's a, you know, it's a deep question. Most people think this is you know, now a permanent feature, but, but as that CEO of Goldman Sachs uh, suggested, yeah. uh, you know, there, there are many downsides of working from home. Yeah. Well, now, let's take this a bit further, because the working from home for many is an attractive option. But the Business Council of Australia President, Tim Reid, has said that white-collar jobs could be outsourced to lower-paid workers overseas if working from home becomes the norm. So are mm. people making a rod for their own back here? If working from home can be done remotely, remote could mean outside mm. Australia. Mm. No, look, I think that's, that's certainly right. I think, I think that Tim Reid is right. I mean, f for many decades in the manufacturing sector, this is what's happened. The jobs have all been outsourced. Yep. It's increasingly become the norm, both, you know, kind of, uh, both socially and economically, to do that. And I think we could start to see that now with white-collar workforce. I mean, why not employ someone in Eastern Europe or in in uh, the Philippines to, you know, to do more of these office jobs because there's no point in employing an Australian to do it for, you know, for maybe two or three times the wage Absolute. when they're not even going to come into the office. Absolutely. I mean, you quoted that Sydney University survey. Three quarters of workers mm. expected the option of working from home to remain post-coronavirus. Mm. But as you say, this persistent argument that everyone during coronavirus shared the burden, for many white-collar yeah. workers, there was no burden, was there? Yes, look, no, that's right, Helen. We've certainly discussed this uh, before, but I reckon for a good fifth or a quarter of the labour force, it's been a fantastic year, really. The same pay, more flexibility, uh, more leisure time. Yeah, the question is, is this a sustainable for the long haul? I would mm. say that ultimately the wages of these workers uh, will have to fall if they're going to stay home yeah. because part of their original wage was compensation for the travel costs, the dry cleaning and so forth. Uh, they don't have those costs anymore. Plus, as we've just said, they now have the pressure potentially of these hundreds of millions of workers from around the world who would, you know, who would quite like their jobs and are quite happy to log on to Zoom and stay up late. So basically the message is be in a hurry, get back into the office just to keep your job. I mean, it is a strong argument, isn't it? And if the job can be done from home, someone can equally do it from Manila or Dakar. Yeah, yeah. And also, it's uh, much, much easier to sack people when they're overseas and when you that's don't know it. them, you know, when you don't know them personally. So I think that's another incentive, ultimately, for big corporations to, you know, to shift more of these jobs. Definitely. Options. And and why would an Australian-based data analyst, if it re really saw them in person, whether why would you employ one of them when you could get an Indian or an East European just mm. as smart but available for a quarter mm. of the price? Yeah, no, certainly. It's certainly a good way for these companies to get around the very strict labour laws here in Australia too and, you know, the very high minimum wages. Uh, I mean, it's partly through regulation that we've managed to keep our wages so high and the protection of various industries. But, um, I mean, I think ultimately economics is more powerful than regulation and, and you know, these right. will, will you know, slowly drift offshore. Yeah, because there's been all this talk about work from home, work from home, doesn't mm. it? WFH. But now you're saying WFA, working from <laughs> anywhere. Right. Anywhere. Now, what's this mean for universities? I've long argued that technology will eventually allow people to gain their degrees from prestigious mm. foreign universities. Now, mm. the global demand for academics would collapse. Student accommodation mm. demand would drop. Your sandstone universities and lecture rooms would be like vacant office blocks, wouldn't they? Mm. Yeah, look, that's right. It's, it, it's extraordinary, really, how little uh, universities have actually reformed themselves over the decades. They're still essentially run on you know, almost 19th century lines. And, and if there is this ability to, to, you know, to listen to the lectures from Harvard University, Yale University, 
uh, then why wouldn't students here do that yes. and pay those universities and yes. get a better quality of yes. lecture than, you know, than be supporting Absolutely. hundreds of academics here doing, you know, doing an inferior job? Just before you go, do you believe these unemployment figures of 5.8%, the unemployment rate has fallen from 6.3 to 5.8, an extra 88,000 people found employment last month. Is that the feeling you get when you move around? Mm. Well, look, certainly that is good news, but we've still got some way to go to get back to the 5.1% that we had uh, just over a year ago, and that, you know, that equals hundreds of thousands of people. And, of course, JobKeeper is coming off uh, very, very shortly, and so I do expect that, that unemployment rate to stall and not not fall so uh, so fast now. So so I think it's important not to be too triumphal. But about the underemployment also, rate's gone yeah. up. The underemployment mm. rate's gone mm. up, eh? Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, certainly there are, you know, there are lots of people who would like to work more hours and that's, you know, that's been a real problem in the economy for some time. And what time. about this and data? Also... Sorry, mm. sorry, go on. No, no, just say, look, even if we do get back to 5.1%, you know, we now have, um, our state and federal governments now have $600 billion more debt. So it's, you know, it's not necessarily a great achievement that, you know, that we've Absolutely. had over the past 12 months. Brilliant. What about just before you go, this data from Small Business Australia analysing the impacts of the pandemic on 600 operators from more than 25 sectors nationally, and it found that out of nearly all of the nation's 2.2 million small businesses, many either had to close or change the way they operated mm. because of coronavirus. How do we look at these unemployment figures today, which are good, mm. against the survey which showed that when JobKeeper support mm. is turned off, more than 488,000 mm. staff will have to be let go? Mm. Yeah, well, look, at, you know, certainly many of these small businesses will you know, will not survive. You know, many, many thousands, uh, just like many tens of thousands of you know, jobs won't come back. And I think it just reflects the you know the really lopsided burden of the whole crisis. The big corporations are fine, and yeah. they're going forward, they'll have even more market power to lift their prices. And all the small players and the lower paid workers have suffered the most. Yeah, I uh, mean, so the aggregate figures often you know skirt. My skirt word. Over. My word, 149,000 on this survey, 149,000 businesses will close indefinitely and 98,000 will close permanently. I mean, they're massive figures, aren't they? No, look, that's certainly right. They are massive. And, of course, you know, they are, you know, they're concentrated in the tourism industry, the hospitality industry. And, you know, once again, it's, you know, it's easy to look at the aggregate unemployment rate and say, oh, it's falling, and that's a great thing. But, you know, these are people's livelihoods here that, that in many cases have been destroyed for a decade, basically. Mm. Uh, so, so it's you know it's certainly you know the burden has you know has fallen very much on those people and not on the white collar workers at least so far that we discussed earlier. Good on you. Good to talk to you, Nelson. Good luck in the new venture. Thanks, we'll, con we'll continue to talk to you. Indeed. It's just that you'll be a lot further away than you mm, currently indeed. are. But we know you'll do well. Your ability, your scholarship, and your capacity to handle detail will stand you in good stead. We're grateful and we wish Thanks you very well. Much, Alan. There he is, Thank Adam you. Crichton.